Unlimited atonement, sometimes called general atonement or universal atonement, is a doctrine in Protestant Christianity that is normally associated with Amaraldians and non-Calvinist Christians. The doctrine states that Jesus died as a propitiation for the benefit of mankind without exception. It is a doctrine distinct from other elements of the Calvinist acronym TULIP and is contrary to the Calvinist doctrine of limited atonement. A doctrinal issue that divides Christians is the question of the extent of the atonement. Did Christ bear the sins of the elect alone on the cross, or did his death expiate the sins of all human beings? Those who take this view read scriptures such as John chapter 3 verse 16, 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 6, 4:10, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9, 1 John chapter 2 verse 2 to say that the Bible teaches unlimited atonement. Topic: Historical background In response to the Remonstrance Five Articles of Remonstrance, the Synod of Dort published the Canons of Dort which included limited atonement. One of the stronger, more vocal proponents of unlimited atonement was John Wesley. Jonathan Edwards also advocated unlimited atonement. George Whitefield opposed the view. It should also be noted that the namesake of the Calvinist systematic theological viewpoint, John Calvin, seemingly expressed an unlimited atonement position in several passages from his published commentaries. <laughs> <laughs> Doctrine The terms unlimited, universal, and general are somewhat of a misnomer and have been adopted primarily to distinguish this doctrine from a Calvinist understanding of limited atonement. More accurately, the call of the gospel is universal and there are no limits on who can believe through faith, but the legal payment is still regarded as limited only to those that respond through faith in Jesus. Thus, it is not the same as the doctrine of universal salvation, which holds that all souls will ultimately be reconciled to God, irrespective of faith. The following statements regarding what it states and what it does not state are subject to close scrutiny of which many distinguished theologians on both sides of this issue disagree. What it states the purpose of the atonement was universal. Jesus died on behalf of all people, not just the elect. The atonement makes a way for all to respond to the gospel call. Part of the effect of the atonement is the restoration of the ability to respond to God's call of salvation. See prevenient grace. Salvation is available for all. The doctrine of unlimited atonement rejects the predeterminism associated with Calvinism and states that every human has the opportunity to accept Jesus through faith. The atonement legally pays for the sins of those who believe on Jesus. Only those who believe on Jesus are forgiven. Only the believer's sins are paid for. It does not state Jesus paid the penalty for those who deny faith in him, and his death was a substitutionary atonement for those who deny him. Though the term unlimited atonement can easily give the incorrect assumption that Jesus's payment encompassed all people, unlimited atonement maintains a limit on the legal effect. Jesus's death was indeed an offer of a substitutionary atonement to all, but this offer was resistible. Though salvation is offered to all, not all are saved. Amaraldism, commonly called four-point Calvinism, holds to a view of unlimited atonement that is very similar but not synonymous with the traditional Arminian understanding. Teaches that God has provided Christ's atonement for all alike, but seeing that none would believe on their own, he then elects those whom he will bring to faith in Christ, thereby preserving the Calvinist doctrine of the unconditional election of individuals. Unlimited atonement has a number of important points in common with traditional formulations of limited atonement. Both positions affirm that the call of salvation can genuinely be made universally. Jesus paid the penalty only for those who have faith in him. Jesus's death was a substitutionary atonement only for those who accept him. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Biblical passages. All quotes from the NKJV unless otherwise noted, emphasis added. 
Topic: <laughs> Scriptures used in support of unlimited atonement. These are scriptures commonly used by those who support unlimited atonement. John chapter 1 verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John chapter 3 verses 14 to 18. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Romans chapter 3 verses 23 to 24. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus." Romans 5 verse 18. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. 2 Corinthians 5 verses 14–15. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 19. I n Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 15. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 3 to 6. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, to be testified in due time. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 10. For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. Titus chapter 2 verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 1. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them. Quote, this appears to indicate that Christ bought some who are not among the elect. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us ward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 1 John chapter 2 verse 2. And he Christ himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only but also for the whole world. 1 John chapter 4 verse 14. And we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent his Son as the world's Saviour. Scriptures used to criticize unlimited atonement These are scriptures commonly used by those who deny unlimited atonement. 
John chapter 10 verses 2 to 5, 11, 14 to 15. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd gives his life for the sheep. I am the Good Shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. This is usually reconciled by pointing out that Jesus died for everyone in theory, but he did it particularly for those who would follow him. John chapter 17 verse 9 I do not pray for the world but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. This is usually reconciled by claiming that this does not refer to the atonement itself. Acts chapter 20 verse 28 Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. This again is often reconciled by saying that Christ's death is only effective for those who come to the church, even though it is potentially effective for all. Romans chapter 8 verses 33 to 34. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Attempts to reconcile this may point to the fact that in the unlimited view, Christ still only intercedes for those who follow him. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. This is usually reconciled by saying that he did it particularly for those who would follow him, although it was potentially effective for all. Topic. See also. Atonement in Christianity Conditional election Unconditional election Provenient grace